Now, when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard, Jesus is making and baptizing more disciples than John, although it was not Jesus himself, but his disciples who baptized, he left Judea and started back to Galilee. But he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had already gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? She asks this because Jews do not share things in common with the Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it was that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water, the woman said to him. Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well, and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come back. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You, will wor your, your, you worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. Just then, his disciples came. They were astonished that he was speaking with a woman, but no one said, what do you want? Or why are you speaking with her? Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, come and see a man who told me everything I have ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? They left the city and were on their way to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, Surely no one has brought him something to eat. Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to complete his work. Do you not say four months more, then come the harvest? But I tell you, look around you and see how the fields are ripe for harvesting. The reaper is already receiving wages and is gathering fruit for eternal life, so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you do not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. Many Samaritans from that city believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I've ever done. So, when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there for two days. And many more believed, many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, It is no longer because of what you have said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, 
and we know that this is truly the savior of the world. Would you pray with me? God, we are grateful to be together today. We pray that you would open up our hearts and our minds for the good news, uh, whether it be a word of comfort, uh, a word of challenge. Uh, pray that you would uh, bless us with a word from you this morning. Amen. Well, it is really lovely to be with you all this morning. Uh, I'd like to say a special thank you to uh, the youth for sharing your leadership um, on this Sunday. Thank you, Pastor Melissa and Deborah, for inviting me to be a part um, of this meaningful day. Um, as Melissa mentioned to you already, uh, I am Deborah's spouse, and when Deborah and I first uh, got together, I began to notice some of Deborah's idiosyncrasies, um, as one does, and uh, I wanted to share one. I did ask for permission. Um, one uh, thing about Deborah is that Deborah uh, cannot stand to have smudges on her glasses. Uh, now, you may not know that Deborah even wears glasses because with masks, she doesn't wear them very often. Um, but she does, and so much so that when she wears glasses, she carries around a special like microfiber cloth or something to get those smudges off of her lenses. And I have to say, as much as I gave her a hard time about it at first, I have to agree, and I even have one of those special cloths myself now. Um, and smudgy lenses are pretty annoying for those of us. Any glasses wearers in here? Um, those smudges can really get in the way of an experience, a conversation you're having, or something you're reading. So our story today is in some ways a story about smudgy lenses. And I'd like to share two lessons about smudgy lenses that I think we can learn from this story. But first, if you didn't notice, um, we have quite a long text today. This encounter with the Samaritan woman at the well is, in fact, Jesus' longest recorded one-on-one -on -one conversation. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a bird's eye view um, of what happens and then dive into just a couple of details in the story. Because if we went verse by verse, we'd have to bring in some food and then that would be problematic and we'd be here till like 6 p.m. So our youth already did a wonderful job of reading all 42 verses of our narrative lectionary text for us. So let's just give a fast-paced review. What we've got is Jesus journeying with his disciples from Judea back to Galilee. And the most efficient route would be to go through Samaria, even though Jewish travelers would often take a longer route, precisely to avoid going through that region and to avoid encounters with Samaritans altogether for reasons that will become clearer as we get into the story. So they're trudging through the desert, and it's noon. It's the heat of the day, and they're hot, and they're tired from traveling. And the disciples veer towards the city, the city center to buy food, and Jesus decides to stop instead, alone, at a well outside of the, of the city. No one else stays with him presumably because they don't have a bucket and the well is deep and they can't get any water out of the well anyway. A woman approaches uh, to draw water and Jesus tells her to give him a drink. Rather than dipping her bucket into the water for him, the woman asks Jesus why he would request this of her, given that she is a Samaritan woman. A robust conversation unfolds where they touch on some of the theological views that have led to the conflict between the Samaritans and the rest of the Jewish community. Jesus then claims to have living water, which, by the way, is a really fun play on words. In Greek, living water can basically mean what we say when we uh, use the words running water, or in the natural world, 
water from a spring. So not still water, like water in a bucket or a bowl, but water that is flowing, water that won't dry up. So if you think about it, in a desert, this is a gold mine. But of course, the author of John and Jesus here is using a double meaning. He's saying, I can offer you the water for life, water that brings abundant life, eternal life. I can offer you living water. But the woman is thinking about the first meaning, and she says, great, give me living water. I won't keep uh, trudging out to this well. So Jesus then tells her in what seems to be a non sequitur, go and call your husband, revealing that he knows things about her personal life, and her personal context, that she is currently unmarried, but with a man and has been married five times previously. She's honest with him. She calls him a prophet and then begins to pose more theological questions about things like where to worship, which was an important dispute for Samaritans and Jewish people. She excitedly brings up that one day the Messiah will come and Jesus responds, saying, I am. And with really bad timing, the disciples return just now <laughs> and kind of interrupt the whole thing. So long story short, okay, well, it's not that short. I've used like a third of my time already. Somehow in this complex encounter, this woman really gets it. She understands the good news about who Jesus is and what it means for the world. And then she goes back to her city and she tells everyone. Okay, so back to the smudgy lenses on the glasses. I want to share two lessons we can learn from this story. So the first lesson, lesson one, smudgy lenses about our encounters with text. Whenever we encounter a biblical story, we have on a set of lenses. We carry with us assumptions about the way that the world works, who matters, what the Bible is supposed to do or what the Bible is supposed to tell us, and a host of other things. And we have these lenses whether we realize it or whether we don't. When we come to a story like this one, it can be helpful to take a step back and check whether some assumptions that are prevalent in our world might be guiding the way that we are taking in the story. We as readers are filling in gaps in the story. There are spaces in between the lines of the story. So in this story, some questions might arise, for example, about this woman. Why is this woman coming to the well alone in the middle of the day? Why has this woman been married five times? Why is this woman living with a man who is not her husband? What does that mean? Why does this matter? And the truth is, Many commentators on the Bible, people who write about this, do focus quite a bit on all of these questions about this woman's life or lifestyle. But one of my favorite commentators on the Gospel of John, a woman named Gail O'Day, wrote in her commentary on the Gospel of John, the reasons for the woman's marital history intrigue commentators but do not seem to concern Jesus. Nor does Jesus pass moral judgment on the woman. All such judgments are imported into the text by interpreters. So why do interpreters pass moral judgment on this woman? Why might we, by default, the truth is we are conditioned to label this woman like we are conditioned to unfairly label most women who find themselves in unfortunate or vulnerable situations. 
This is the result of our patriarchal culture, years of socially constructed ideologies of gender. Another way of saying that, we have some pretty strong smudges on our lenses that lead us to make assumptions as we fill in the gaps of stories. When we think about the ancient world, there are a number of reasons that a woman might have been married several times, like a lot of reasons for death in the ancient world, like the fact that men could divorce their wives for a number of reasons in the ancient world. What's more important, perhaps, for us to understand is that Jesus' response to the woman does not condemn her or question her character. Rather, perceiving more clearly, we might recognize the vulnerability of this woman's situation. And what's more, if we approach this story without preconceived notions about the woman, we see that she plays a powerful role in this story as a positive model of encountering Jesus and offering us a second lesson about smudgy lenses. So, lesson two, smudgy lenses in our encounters with others. So digging deeper into the story, we can see it's not only in encountering biblical stories that we may have smudgy lenses. Whenever we encounter anything or anyone, we also have on a set of lenses. Again, whether we recognize it or not, maybe it's better to say that our experiences, our history, our identity, our position in life, those factors that make up who we are, our access to privilege, our access to power, those really difficult or really amazing things that have happened to us or those closest to us, all of these things create a set of lenses or sometimes put smudges on those lenses through which we perceive other people. In this story, our two main characters also have on a set of lenses with a lot of smudges on them that threaten to distort their encounter with one another. The narrator tells us in verse 9 that at that time, Jewish people did not share things in common with the Samaritans. Now, this is a really loaded statement. Not only do they have a host of theological differences, there's a long and sordid history of mistreatment and acts of violence between these two communities. Once considered a part of the Jewish community, Samaritans had been ostracized for, cent for centuries. Jewish people basically considered them like they considered Gentiles. Not only would they avoid traveling through the region, they would avoid contacts with Samaritans altogether not sharing drinks or food or utensils or vessels, like, for instance, a water jar. So just think for a moment about the weight of Jesus' statement to this woman, give me a drink. It is no wonder that she reacted the way that she did. Right off the bat, we have got a major smudge between this Jewish man and this Samari Samaritan woman. And then there's the issue of gender. At this time and in this society, it would have been completely indecent, not to mention dangerous for this woman, for a man to meet a woman alone. This is why the disciples are so surprised when they return to the scene. But together, Jesus and this woman overcome these barriers. They clear away the smudges. They really perceive one another. They connect sincerely. In their encounter, we can see three mutual moves that I think can be instructive for us as we encounter others. The first is mutual recognition. Jesus and the Samaritan woman have every reason not to give one another but the benefit of the doubt. I don't mean to diminish the factors that divided them. They are valid. But I want to call attention to how powerful it is that when they did not allow these factors to define their encounter, what a difference it makes. 
Rather than allowing the stereotypes or the loaded expectations to define the other person, they allowed space to truly recognize the other. Jesus describes to this woman that he understands her life and her context without judgment, and the woman asks sincere questions until she recognizes who Jesus is. The second move is mutual vulnerability. Now, don't get me wrong. There is a power differential here. First of all, Jesus is God incarnate. (laughs) Um, But also, Jesus is a man in a position of power over this woman. But by staying behind at a well in the desert without a bucket, Jesus places himself in a vulnerable position with this woman. And in order to get his message to the Samaritan community, he places himself in need of her action, in need of her bucket, which she does leave behind at the end of the story, by the way, and in need of her testimony for his ministry. And this takes us to the final move, which is a move of mutual empowerment. Building on that mutual recognition and that mutual vulnerability, the Samaritan woman is empowered to become one of the first evangelists in this gospel. She returns to the city to tell the good news, and the ultimate result of her message is a widespread following of Jesus by the Samaritan community. So to wrap up, let's consider our lenses and the smudges that may be on them. How we read the Bible and how we encounter others, these encounters are shaped by our experiences and our own positions in the world. Can we move towards mutual recognition, vulnerability and empowerment when we encounter others? What if our personal encounters across difference What if these personal, individual encounters can begin the work of bridging whole communities that are divided? I think that work begins by checking our lenses and beginning to clear off those smudges. So a few final questions to close in reflection. What smudges have clouded how others perceive you. Who needs the news that you have to share? What smudges might be clouding how you perceive someone or some other community? What wells could you go and sit beside And who might you encounter?